I'm Angel Mannion. I'm the program director for Opera Hack. Um, really excited about this project. If you're unaware, Opera Hack uh, is an upcoming hackathon where we've got 150 people to coming together on, on an online platform over the course of a month. And we've identified 15 challenges for people to work on. So essentially it's just a collective of people from theater and technology to solve problems that we've identified. Um, at the end of it, we're going to give away $15,000, which uh, to three winning ideas for $5,000 each. Um, each of these challenges range from hot topics like racial diversity, environmental sustainability, to practical ones like inefficiencies with the production, rehearsal, and audition processes. Um, and right now, we just set up a Discord server, uh, which is basically an online communication tool for people to start forming teams and talking together. And uh, there's almost 80 people involved right now where they're already starting to talk and create channels um, and just discussing like what projects they're working on. So I'm really excited. Some of you that are in this chat are already on it. So um, if you haven't joined it yet and you're part of the, you're one of the participants, please join it because it's pretty exciting. Um, today, we have David Adam Moore and Chris Warren who are both advisory panel members for this project. So David Adam Moore and Chris Warren are helping us um, basically facilitate the hackathon, answer questions throughout the process. Um, they're gonna be part of a couple events where we'll be focusing on a few of the challenges that we're working on. Um, and they're gonna help select the winning ideas too at the end of it. Um, I'll give it over to you, David, who is the director of our company. Uh, Great. To introduce them. Thanks, Angel. I just want to just say one quick thing before we get started and just making sure everybody understands. Angel did a pretty good job of describing what the hackathon is, but you know, we think of this as kind of a, an ideation exercise. And uh, our first hackathon, we didn't provide them with challenges. We just let people kind of come up with their own ideas, form groups, come up with their own ideas of how technology could help the industry and not we don't we really we think of it bigger than just the opera industry we think of it as music theater in general but if you think about the building blocks of music theater we're talking about um composition and some music and lyrics and those are some of the participants but also designers also artists people that are singers and performers directors and when we think of design we have a lot of different areas of design we think of um you know, uh, scenic design and costume design, but also sound and audio design. I think we're gonna be focusing on some of that today, the in sonic world. Um, and then we bring in people that are, you know, in the areas of virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing, haptics, all kinds of things. And how do we get those skills together, put those brains together and think about how we can come up with ideas to help the industry. Um, and that's really where we are with it. And it's very exciting. I have to say, we had no idea in the first hack what it was going to wind up being. And it was incredibly exciting and um, positive. And we're excited about doing this. We will do one this year and one next year, two one-year hacks. And I actually think that um, doing it virtually is going to benefit us greatly because we have the ability for a lot more people around the world to participate in a way that we didn't in the first hack when we had to actually have people come to San Diego to participate. So anyway, I just had to give my kind of framework about it and how excited we are. Also, San Diego is increasingly known as an innovation city and also a city where technology is becoming more and more important of an industry. And so it makes sense for San Diego Opera to be hosting the Opera Hack. And that's all I wanted to say. And Angel, if you want to introduce our guests again and let them get started. Sure. And I will add that there are people participating from all over the US, Canada, Europe, and Asia even. Um, so it is a pretty exciting project. Um, first, I will introduce David Adam Moore. Shall I go ahead and begin? Yeah, please. Angel. Okay. Uh, well, my name is David Adam Moore. I am a, um, I'm an operatic baritone. I've sung over 65 roles in uh, most of the major houses, and uh, I've been doing it for some years. And in the last decade or so, especially in the last five years, I've added another layer to my career as a digital media artist, which was something that I had been, um, I had been engaged with this actually since before I got into opera. Um, but I started doing it professionally and uh, working as a, um, a, a, a projection and scenic designer. I've been doing multimedia digital art installations 
Uh, I've been composing electronic music and a number of other things in addition to my full-time opera career and in, and in many cases in combination to with my full-time opera career. Um, so what I really want to talk about today has to do with the power of the human voice and what it is that we need to preserve as we enter uh, into the later stages of the, the information age and, and what many are beginning to call the imagination age, uh, an age in which technology has taken over so many of the mundane operations of society that up until this point required uh, a lot of technical knowledge and analysis. And eventually this is going to be uh, operated by some version of automation and AI. And so we need to find our place and we need to be getting ready now to find our place in that. And so what I'm gonna do is walk us through a at breakneck speed. And so forgive me if some of the things I say are gonna be inaccurate, but I'm gonna walk through the history of the human voice <laughs> so that we can kind of get some kind of perspective of you know, what it is that lies at the very essence of opera, and, and that is listening to, experiencing the unamplified human voice in three-dimensional real space in a collective environment. And I think that's so important. Um, so I am going to get my slideshow up and running here. So I'm calling this talk the invisible instrument um, because this, you know, the voice is it's it's invisible in a sense, um, yet it's incredibly powerful. And I would make the argument that operatic classical singing is the most beautiful thing that can possibly be done with the human body, um, and there are many many reasons for that, and uh, which we will explore. So, if we're looking at the history of technology, um, we started with the Stone Age, then we moved into the Bronze Age, uh, developed steel, glass, and processed minerals in the Iron Age. Uh, the Middle Ages are also called the Porcelain, porcelain Age, in which porcelain ceramics were developed. Um, then we have the Industrial Era, which we've Ex we're still sort of experiencing the tail end of, uh, especially in terms of like the way our culture is structured at the moment. Um, and since the development of transistors in the 1950s, we've been uh, really in the thick of the information age, and that's really come to a head since the 1990s with the internet. So what makes opera unique in the information age? I would argue that it's these four things among many others. It's, opera is the largest scale ongoing presentation of historical works. It has the most budget, it has the most uh, sort, sort of protective structure in terms of reproducing, you know, essentially 400 years worth of uh, music and theater works and, and bringing them to life and keep them, keeping them alive. And so the, the, the preservationist tendency of opera, I think, is an incredibly important one. But it's not the only one that's important, but it is important. It's the largest scale unamplified art form. And this is what I think is so important to us in the scale of human civilization. At this stage in history, in the information age, everything has gone through uh, screens and speakers in terms of entertainment and, and any, any sort of uh, public gathering. Uh, the, the media, the, the content of pub public gathering is always mediated through screens and speakers. And, um, and, opera is, and opera and classical music in general is generally purely acoustic. And it's really, it's the largest scale on amplified art form. It's, it's the, uh, it's, it could be the last one of this scale. And, and, that's, and that's really, really important, especially as we move into new types of sound technologies, which uh, Dr. Ward and I are going to talk about later. Um, public gathering spaces are increasingly rare in our culture. Opera allows many, many people, thousands of people at one time 
to come together in one space. And I know we all miss this now after 14 months, but it allows us all to gather in one space and experience something together in real time and to experience something that actually is spatial. When you sit in a theater, you know exactly where that violin solo is coming from. You know exactly where this character is on stage. You hear it. You even feel them a little bit in your body. And, and it's, our experience of that is much more subtle than the way that we experience amplified music. And that's something that we'll talk about a bit later as well. Opera singers. <laughs> Opera singers are the Jedis of musicians. And they can do anything with their voices. They can make superhuman sounds that eliminate the need for microphones. Uh, so we have this ability to, to self-amplify. Um, they practice an old craft that is passed down from master to student over generations from one body to another body. There's no way to transfer this information digitally or through books. The power of the human voice. I really love this quote from uh, Daniel Levitin in his book, The World in Six Songs. It's synchronous, coordinated song and movement are what created the strongest bonds between early humans or proto-humans. And these allowed for the formation of larger living groups. Uh, up to a certain point, we were only able to, um, to gather in groups of like about 125 or so. And being able to sing together was one of the things that actually allowed us to operate in larger groups and evolve into a civilization. Um, and eventually, okay, so it, it allowed the formation of larger living groups and eventually of society as we know it. Sound has advantages over vision. It transmits in the dark. It travels around corners, can reach people who are visually obscured. In the open savanna, a lone individual waving his arms may not draw attention, whereas something shouting will. Music, as a highly structured form of sound communication, enabled the synchronization of movement even when group members didn't see each other. It allowed for distinctive vocal messages that could be transmitted across territories. For that matter, distinctive whistles and calls could have functioned as much as a, a kind of secret club, clubhouse knock, which allows identification of people we can't see. And then another point is that singing, the act of singing together releases a biochemical, a neurochemical called oxytocin, uh, which is now known to be involved in establishing bonds of trust between people. So if we look at the evolution of the human voice, I won't get too deep into this because it's, it's very complicated and actually quite controversial in many ways. But basically, as we went from our earlier hominid ancestors up to Homo sapiens, particularly between the Homo erectus and Homo neanderthal, sorry, I cannot, the neanderthals, let's just say that. Um, when Homo sapiens developed roughly 200,000 years ago, um, there came a change in the design of our larynx and our, of our vocal tract. Um, the, the point from the vocal cords to the tip of the lips became lengthened and the muscles of the vocal folds and the muscles in the resonating chamber, chamber meaning the back of our throat and our mouth, um, became much more highly developed to where they could reconfigure themselves to make, number one, to make louder sounds, number two, to make a variety of vowel colors. And so a new kind of ability to sing and produce language came along with Homo sapiens. This is the human larynx. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing by design, uh, especially this here in the front. You see this is called the thyroid cartilage in front, and then just below that is the hyoid bone. Can you guys see my mouse, my cursor? Okay, good, great. Good, because I'd love to be able to, uh, to point to things. So yeah, this is this amazing work of art. So what we learned how to do very, very early on with this new lyrics is to self-amplify. And it was a survival technique. Um, 
some people believe that the vocal folds were evolved as a mechanism to keep food from going down our windpipe. So it's, it's sort of a catch valve. Um, but we've learned how to, uh, to, to, to use this to express ourselves in very, very deep ways. And, and this instrument and our use of the instrument co-evolved with the evolution of music. So here's the larynx again. So the vocal folds are located about right here, just at the base of the thyroid cartilage. So basically the way it works is the, um, the vocal folds, which you can see here on the left, so these are these two tiny, tiny little pieces of skin, and it, or tissue rather, and they have a ligament that runs through them, and then, then they have uh, a, a, a sort of an array of muscles and cartilage around them, and they move the core, these, these ligaments, uh, which have very delicate tissues on them, they move them together, and as we blow air through them, um, they make this sound. Now, if you were to put a microphone right next to the vocal folds, all you would hear would be a sound like <laughs> like that. You would hear no color to the sound or anything like that. If you look from the level of the vocal folds up through this chamber here, so here's the mouth, and then here's the nose. So basically what happens is we self-amplify and color our sound by having it reverberate around in these chambers and then we tune the shape of the back of our throats and our tongues with the vowel in order to release a sound that is essentially supercharged by the time it gets out of our, our by the time the sound passes our lips. And so what opera singers do and what various other kinds of humans who have needed to be heard have done uh, since since our you know or origins is to actually tune this sound into the most beautiful and uh, striking and powerful sound we possibly can. So these are actual photos of vocal folds. This is when the vocal folds are completely closed, and then this is when they're open. And that cycle of opening and closing is what creates the fundamental frequency of the sound, which actually determines the pitch of the sound. What opera singers are particularly good at is developing the musculature around these vocal folds so that when they do bring the vocal folds together, they can do it with an incredible level of both strength and control. So this is an old school German resonance chart and uh, the singers and voice teachers among us are probably gonna have thoughts and feelings about this uh, <laughs> because it shows, uh, look, I'm not standing behind this as it's, it's, it's somewhat theoretical uh, because it shows where the resonance lies in different notes of the scale. But this is largely based on this, the types of sensations that we feel when we sing. And uh, I just wanted to like look again at how we use these cavities as resonators in the same way that like a, a brass instrument would use the, the buzz of the lips as the sound source, and, but the horn as the resonator. So here it is again. This is a, a cleaner view, less controversial view. So this is really fascinating. This is uh, a technology that I worked with back when I was in college with my mentor, who is a, a, a well-known, he was a well-known voice pedagogue named Richard Miller, uh, who wrote several books on the pedagogy of singing and on acoustics and physiology. So this is the secret of how singers are able to project their voices over an orchestra. Over an orchestra. Uh, this shows us the secret. So this is called um, a harmonic spectrograph. And uh, what it does is it gives us an image of the sound. So if you're looking from left to right, this is the time axis. And then from bottom to top, that's the frequency axis. So it actually shows you 
a representation visually of each frequency within the sound. And what we see is how, if you can see these little bands, um, this is where there's the most acoustic energy within the voice. And if you look at this third band up, um, sorry, it's right here. This is called the singer's formant. And this is an area where instruments, especially when instruments are playing together, uh, they don't have a lot of acoustical strength. But the voice can, have, can be uh, produced in such a way that it creates a lot of acoustical strength in that third format. And this is what gives that voice its ping or its zing. It's that steely quality that opera singers have. And, and that's what helps us pierce through the orchestra. It's partly because we're creating a lot of strength in that area by tuning our, our, um, our resonator in many ways. But it's also because good composers in opera um, would write for the orchestra in such a way that there is a, a, a sort of cavity of sound. There's not, there's not much orchestral sound in that particular frequency range. And so it's this little pocket where the singer's voice just fits perfectly. Um, if you see this kind of dust along the bottom of the image, this is where the orchestral sound is. Now the orchestral sound also, it, this, this isn't a very sensitive uh, spectrograph, but, it, but there's also more orchestra sound up here in this higher Hertz area. And, um, and this is where the voice fits, just right there in the pocket. So another thing that helps us be heard is architectural amplification. And of course, this is a, a very, very old art. Um, the, one of the, the uh, you know, father figures of architecture named Vitruvius, he wrote in 20 BC, uh, therefore the ancient architects following nature's footsteps traced the voice as it rose and carried out the ascent of the theater seats. By the rules of mathematics and the method of music, they sought to make the voices from the stage rise more clearly and sweetly to the spectator's ears. For just as organs, which have bronze plates or horn sounding boards that are, uh, are brought to the clear sound of string instruments, so by the arrangement of theaters in accordance with the science of harmony, the ancients increased the power of the voice. So even, even during the Greek civilization, uh, in which you know, music was a massive part of, of their of their civilization. And we have, uh, unfortunately, very little written evidence of what their music sounded like. But even back then, they were designing outdoor spaces to be acoustically friendly and to help the voice specifically. This is the Greek the theater at Epidaurus. I, I think it's something like, um, it's a popular tourist destination. It's something, it's over 4,000 seats. It might be even much more. Um, some of the largest opera houses today are like 37, 3,800 seats, uh, and this is outdoors. So they were able to design this in such a way that actually amplified the voice perfectly in an outdoor setting, which is just remarkable. So, of course, we all know the story of opera. Along after that came church music, then came the development of opera with Monteverdi. Monteverdi had a massive theater built for his operas. Um, I think it was something, it was four or 5,000 seats itself. Um, and then, starting in the 19th century during the industrial age, um, we start getting electrical amplification. I'm just gonna blast through this uh, because I really wanna get to um, the, the further in the conversation talking about the future of opera. but. So 1875, David Edward Hughes invents the carbon microphone. This is still used in telephones today. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, not only through the 80s, not today, um, because we use cell phones. Um, <laughs> 1877, Thomas Edison invents the phonograph. It's the first device that could reproduce sound. Um, in the earlier days of the phonograph, he was having trouble getting, he was trying to get singers from the Met over to New Jersey to, uh, to record for him. And the reason why he had to use opera singers is because opera singers sang so loudly that it was enough to actually move the instrumentation to, to dig the needle into the clay and make the recording. Um, 
he wasn't he wanted to get uh some of the most famous singers of the day like caruso but uh he wasn't able to because they were very skeptical of this this newfangled technology. Uh, so instead, he got sort of secondary singers from the Met, and then once they started making these recordings and people saw what they could do, um, the the biggest singers of the day wanted in. So so for that reason, it's really cool that we have really really early recordings of some of the greatest singers uh, of the 19th century. 1915, Magnavox. The Magnavox was invented. It was the first publicly available PA system. It was only 10 watts of power. Um, modern PA systems are in the thousands of watts. Um, it was invented by Ed Edwin, Edwin Jensen and Peter Pridham. It was first uh, premiered in 1915 in San Francisco uh, for a Christmas carol concert for 100,000 people. So it must have made a very loud, very ugly sound. 1930s, foot mics started beginning started being used in musical theater. Um, 1940s, a new kind of music and a new kind of vocalism started to develop because of the microphone. So artists like Peggy Lee and Benny Goodman were using microphones in a sort of electroacoustic arrangement so that they could amplify the voice while performing with an unamplified big band. Uh, the big band was so loud that it didn't need to be amplified, but the voice did. But what this did was it allowed singers to start using a different kind of vocal technique with much less breath support and much more subtlety. And, and this is where singing really started to diverge in a way, because, of course, in operatic singing and at the time in a lot of musical theater, you still had people using properly supported voices, uh, and I know I'm sounding like an opera purist right now. I'm, I am and I'm not. But you had, in musical theater and opera, you had a lot of people, um, you had these singers who were still using the sort of like traditional way of singing, and of which vibrato is a very natural result when you're using that amount of breath pressure. Um, but then you had people like Frank Sinatra and Peggy Lee coming up, and Bing Crosby, who were able to, to sing with sort of half voice, which allowed a lot of new artistic uh, possibilities. In the 1950s, foot, mic foot mics in musical theater came into regular use. Um, Rodgers and Hammerstein loved them. Um, West Side Story was, was the world premiere of that in the 50s. Was, uh, use, it, it used foot mics. It was completely amplified. Uh, also in the 1950s, the advent of the solid body electric guitar and rock and roll music kickstarted an upsurge in amplification levels. Um, these solid body electric guitars, when they would run through speakers, they would tend to, to distort because the speakers were not very powerful. And so that led to a new aesthetic. And it also led to just higher amplification levels at concerts all across the board. And then in the 60s, this, this increased. Uh, and then in, seven, in the early 70s, I'm, I'm skipping off the timeline here, but in the early 70s, um, sound engineers for rock and pop concerts figure out, figured out ways to make larger and larger arrays of speakers to up the sound levels once again uh, so that audiences could feel very viscerally in their bodies the sound. Uh, 1960s wireless radio body mics were developed and started being used in musical theater. Uh, 1964, Funny Girl was the first Broadway show to use wireless mics. And then in the 1970s and 80s, wireless mics and foot mics continued to be used in combination with one another. So this brings us to now, um, opera in the information age. We're in a very, very unique position. And it's because we're facing incredibly transformative technologies that are going to allow us to do very new things. But in my opinion, they're also going to allow us to abandon some of the old Jedi ways of fully supporting the voice and, and of enjoying a purely acoustic um, experience. Um, so and it brings us to two points. Opera has dual imperatives, really from this point on. We have to act as a cultural repository, and we have to act as a cultural contributor. If we act only as a cultural repository, 
we're not going to be able to really contribute to the culture in an active way. We're not going to be able to innovate. And innovation, from the very beginning of this art form, innovation has been the tradition. It's always been opera that was the ultimate multimedia art form. It was, it's always been opera that had the funds and, and the risk tolerance to, uh, to try new innovative technologies from its very inception. So I think the question we need to ask ourselves now is how can we both act as a cultural repository, so to be preservationist, and also act as a cultural contributor? and bring opera into the imagination age. Um, so I am part of an art collective called Glimmer, uh, G-L-M-M-R, that's uh, Giving Light, Memory, Motion, and Relevance. And we're very digitally oriented, but we're also very much rooted in opera. And so one project that we've done with this sort of thing in mind is, it's called Book of Dreams. And it's an electroacoustic project uh, in which we have an unamplified voice singing with an array of speakers. Um, and like I was saying earlier with the harmonic uh, spectrograph, the electronic score that is played through the speakers is designed the way an opera score is in that in, in this, this area of maybe 2400 to 3200 hertz, it doesn't have a lot of sound so that the voice can fit right into that pocket. And the result is that the singer can perform sometimes at almost the, the level of a stage whisper while the speakers are playing loud enough to actually shake the walls. And it's a very otherworldly sound. And, and I'm re really, you know, the, the whole collective, we're, we're really amazed that not more composers have been working with this. But it seems like a really good idea, uh, not for everything, but certainly for some things, to be doing this on a larger and larger scale because singers already know how to self-amplify. And <laughs> vocal Jedis. Um, and let's see. So this is, I'm working with a sound engineer named Garth McAlevey, um, who is at National Sawdust in Brooklyn. Um, so we're working on the electronic score of, of the Book of Dreams uh, to balance it out. So I co-composed the electronic score. Of, well, actually, no. I co-composed the work with David T. Little. Um, and I composed the electronic score in, in whole. And David composed the vocal score. And so we, we uh, composed in a modular way, which was a, a very, very interesting approach. And then here's what the final performance looked like. So this is me, um, no microphone, but there's speakers all above me. There are speakers all around on the floor and I'm actually standing on a subwoofer. I'm standing on a really huge subwoofer and, to, and because I was blindfolded during the entire show to eliminate the need for a conductor, as I created the electronic score, I built cues into the sub-bass areas of the score to let me know when my vocal entrances were coming so that I could subtly pick them up from the buzz of the subwoofer uh, below me. And it worked. The, it, the, the whole piece was very, very experimental, but it actually worked. And so we're very interested to work with this type of idea again uh, as, as our collective. Uh, but we're also interested to see other people try this out. And so this brings us to what is the next stage? What can opera look like in the imagination age? Um, and this is where I would love to bring Dr. Chris Warren in uh, as an expert in spatial sound and, and capturing reverberation. You know, I, I know that there, there are systems, there are systems that already have been developed and are continuing to be developed that can replicate acoustical spaces. And they can replicate them both for a, a sort of XR, extended reality art put, output, like, um, so, you know, through headphones in a, a sort of VR setting. And then there are also ways to replicate sound spatialization with speaker arrays in live places, in live spaces, and even to change the acoustical properties 
of a room using speakers. And so I think something that would serve opera incredibly well would be if we can continue to practice our vocal art, which has been handed down from person to person, arguably since the beginning of our species, um, if we can continue to practice that and generate the sounds that are, that are uh, resulting from that, but while still transferring opera into a digital space and giving it a presence in digital space without having to flatten it down to a stereo signal and without having to flatten this 3D acoustical, this 3D dynamic uh, acoustical nature of the voice uh, by, by running it through circuitry in the way that we have so far. Opera singers hardly ever sound right on recordings. They always sound so much different in an opera house. So, so Chris, could you, could you talk to us some about what are, what are some of the possibilities in terms of spatial sound? Absolutely. So, let me start this off real quick for you. All right. So I'm here to talk about reverberation and um, a little project I've been working on called Echo Thief, which lets us do a little augmented reality sound. So our story starts here at Capitol Records headquarters up near the corner of Hollywood and Vine. If you've ever driven up the 101, you've seen this. Uh, if you've ever watched a Michael Bay movie, you've seen this explode. Uh, but I'm interested not in the recording studios near the top of the building. I'm interested in what is underground, several stories beneath this building. There are, in fact, eight echo chambers. These are not the political echo chambers you hear about on TV. These are the actual, literal rooms made for echoing. So if Frank Sinatra is up in the studio on the seventh floor and would like his voice to sound as though it were in a much richer and more reverberant room, his microphone signal can be sent down, come out of that tie line in the wall, be played through these very loud speakers, bounce around this room, be captured by these microphones and go back up to be combined with the original sound to give Sinatra the illusion of depth, the illusion of being in a larger space. The point I want to make here, Sinatra never set foot in this room. This is not a living space. This is a space solely for the creation of reverberation. Sinatra was put virtually in this space and I'm going to talk a little bit about reverberation and come back to uh, ways that we can virtually put our own voices into spaces such as this. So let's start with a little definition. What is reverberation? It's simply the persistence of a sound after its source is stopped caused by multiple reflections of the sound within a closed space. Seems easy enough, which leads us to another wonderful de definition, anechoic, free from echo and reverberation. This is where I'd like to start. This is our baseline. This is a room with no echo. If I were in this room, I know we're not in the room together, but bear with me for a moment. If I were in this room and I spun around, you would not be able to hear me because the sound bouncing against the walls is entirely absorbed. So these are rooms that are generally used for the testing of audio equipment, um, but the reason why I bring this up is I want to show you here an example of no reverberation. This is a place where all sound will pass you one time and one time alone. Why is it? Well, we have these big foam wedges which cut up the sound wave, give more surface area for absorption, and basically act as a very, very good way to suck up sound. So if we have our definition of reverberation, we can from that derive very easily a definition for artificial reverberation, which is my specialty. Oh, by the way, I'm Dr. Chris Warren. Uh, I teach 
uh, music composition and sound design at San Diego State University. And I see quite a few uh, SDSU folks with us today, which is pretty great. All right, so artificial reverberation, all we need to do is remove the cause. It's the persistence of a sound after its source has stopped. And how? Well, to be determined. So here's one old school way of doing it, a plate reverb. This is a big metal plate about the size of your mattress that is suspended and can wiggle a little bit. There is a transducer that puts energy in it. If this were air, we'd call that a speaker. This thing reverberates and there's a transducer that takes energy out of it. Again, if this were air, we'd call that a microphone. And so this is something where vibrations will linger. Unfortunately, uh, these things cost about a hundred grand and are um, way too large to keep in your living room. How about a smaller alternative? Uh, guitar players, you might know this from the back of your amplifier. Uh, this is a spring reverb, the same concept, but instead of a metal sheet, we're using springs and springs are a little bit more malleable so we can use smaller springs. But still, we are putting the reverberation into another medium other than air. So historically, these are a few ways that we've created artificial reverberation. I want to show you now about my favorite way and what is contemporarily the state of the art in creating lovely, lovely reverberation. So it involves the notion of an impulse response. So this is an impulse and whatever comes back to me from the space is the impulse response. So if I go into a room and clap really loudly and record it, I can get a basic impulse response. And that will tell me everything I need to know about the room in order to digitize it, turn it into a reverberator so that we can, just as Sinatra passed his voice through a actual room, we can pass our voices through a virtualized room to create this wonderful reverberation. Uh, mass heads in the audience, uh, this is a, obviously a direct delta function. Everybody else, don't worry about it. So uh, moving right along, if we take a look at what this looks like in practice, we have a musician at the left up on stage. We have an audience member in the right. The closest, shortest, uh, distance between two points is, is obviously a straight line. So we know that that direct sound is going to be the first thing that hits the audience from the musician. But there are many other reflections throughout the space that will all come to the listener afterwards. If we wanted to make a little graph of this, we could put time on the X axis and amplitude on the Y axis. We can see our initial impulse there on the left and we can see the after a brief delay, we'll start to get more and more reflections, which will slowly decay over time. And so this is where it began. This is uh, my home concert hall, uh, where I was a grad student at UC San Diego. This is the Conrad Previtz Concert Hall, and this is what I used to begin my work in taking acoustic measurements. I mapped this hall and then I mapped it again and then I mapped it a few more times and eventually I got pretty good at mapping. So I started taking this mapping on the road. And it is my opinion that the world is full of interesting resonating spaces and that we use a small fraction of these for music. What if we could make more of these available to music by digitizing them? This is a castle in Havana. It sounds pretty great. I'd love to play a concert right there in the middle. And now virtually I can. Here is a bridge. This is Echo Bridge in Newton Upper Falls, Massachusetts. Uh, this is going right over the Charles River. And uh, this is a lovely parabolic arch, which means there are 13 discrete echoes on this thing as you sing underneath it. Incidentally, this is right down the street from where I went to high school. So this is where I first got my great love of acoustics from hollering under this thing and hearing all of the sound come rushing back at me. 
So I went to slot canyons and tunnels and ice caves, did a little math and was able to take all these places home with me. So I've created a giant library of all these spaces all over. And I call it Echo Thief. Uh, Angel put a link in the chat. So when it, uh, we've used this for everything from audio software, um, web synthesizers. This has been in all sorts of video games, Wolfenstein 2, uh, Days Gone from Sony. Uh, we've, we've put this in a few museum exhibits like uh, the Summer of Innovation at the NAMM Museum of Making Music. And then quarantine hit. And a friend of a friend called me up. So uh, Ms. Guttero is the director of the Vocal Pedagogy Lab at New England Conservatory. And when quarantine began, she called me up and asked me, hey, is there an easy way that my opera singers, who are currently separated from their architecture, can use something like Echo Thief to just put a little reverb in their headphones as they practice. So they, they can virtually locate themselves in some interesting acoustic spaces while we're uh, stuck at home. And uh, I, I did not, in fact, have a way for this to happen. So I sat down uh, with my dev team and we created one. Uh, so we made a real-time version of Echo Thief that basically just takes the input from your microphone, runs it through all these lovely spaces, and puts it right in your headphones. So this lets you sing in a castle in Havana, or in an ice cave in Anchorage, in a tunnel dome under Montreal, in caves in Northern California, and all sorts of fascinating acoustic spots all over North America. In fact, uh, we uh, were kind enough to have the wonderful Angel Mannion help us out with this project. Uh, Mr. Mannion, of course, has sung in just about every choir in town. So one day, Angel and I drove around from church to church to church, and we captured every single church we could. It was pretty great. And so, if you would like this, you can find it at echothief.com. Here's my ask. There are about a hundred and so uh, different spaces in this library. Every single one of them I added to the library because someone told me about it. They found a space with some beautiful resonance, a place that's wonderful to sing a place that really enriches sound. And they dropped me a pin and I went there. Hint, hint. So for those of you that uh, are interested in this sort of thing, if you know of any lovely places, I would love to hear about them. You can email me at cwarren at sdsu.edu. All right, well, I believe it is question time. Thanks, Chris and David. This is just awesome stuff, like all around. Um, I have a question immediately in that. So Chris Warren helped uh, create a challenge for Opera Hack. And it has, it's in relation to um, miking theaters instead of singers. Chris, can you talk about that? Yeah, so um a project that I was part of when I was a grad student at UCSD was helping to set up their Meyer Constellation VRAS system. And what the heck is that? It is a, a acoustic system that can take a room and transform it sonically into another space in real time. So it's, it's as though we can take our concert hall and make it bigger and smaller as we need to. This is a wonderful system created by Meyer Sound, which is a, uh, a fascinating, uh, fascinating lineage, if you want to look that one up. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and uh, there is 
currently a brand new one of these that is just shown up here in lovely San Diego. It's at the Shell, which is the new performance center right behind the convention center, right on the bay. And what this does, this particular one is fascinating. This is just for the musicians. The audience will not hear this or know that it exists. But essentially, this new performance center is acoustically transparent. It is a large fabric building. So unlike all other concert halls, which keep some of that sound in and reflect it back to the musicians, this is basically like playing in an open field acoustically, which means that we need a little extra reinforcement or else uh, that orchestra is going to sound really, really quiet. And so what this does is uh, uh, reflect some of the orchestra sound back to itself. And this is wholly independent of the PA system that amplifies the orchestra out to the hundred or uh, 10,000 of their closest friends there, right there on the peninsula with them. And so what are the challenges to uh, doing something like that? Like, um, what are the current constraints in miking a, a theatrical space? Well, so one of the interesting things about this is that it is, it's different than putting a mic right in front of a singer because you're not amplifying a specific thing in the space, you are amplifying the entirety of the space. And so uh, this can be a little bit more naturalistic potentially than a lot of other um, amplification things. It, it also, uh, I mean, not for nothing, but it, it, it uh, it's going to amplify the whole performance together rather than spots on individual people. It's a lot more like how an acoustic space actually operates. Yeah, that's the thing about architectural amplification is, is basically, you know, this, this evolved over thousands of years in such a way that like the source of the sound is mixed by the architecture itself. So the architecture essentially serves as our mixing board and that's part of what's so special about opera as an acoustic phenomenon is that we get to hear this beautiful blend of sound that's been developed over hundreds of years between the different type, the different voices and the instruments all at once. And so basically the, uh, the, the technology that Angel alluded to is an attempt to uh, uh, find an end run around the, uh, the problems that uh, exist with amplification of vocals in opera. It's been great. Angel, do you want to close us out? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, next week, we will have another presentation by Debbie Wong, who is also a part of our advisory panel, who will give a uh, presentation on her work with VR um, that she does up at Renaissance Opera in Vancouver. Um, she's been developing uh, something called Orpheus VR. It's super fascinating. It'll be just as uh, stimulating as this conversation. Um, everyone in the in this chat room that's involved in Opera Hack, uh, if you haven't joined the Discord channel, uh, I just checked and we're a little bit over 80 participants now. So we've got a little over half of everyone in there so far. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, oh, thanks, Darren. Uh, our presentation by Vita that was postponed will happen on June 2nd. Uh, that's Wednesday. So Wednesday, June 2nd at 3 p.m. Thanks, Chris, for providing your email information. If uh, anyone in here has more questions or you want to get in touch with the advisory panel or you want to know more about Opera Hack, you can email me. It's angel.manion at sdopera.org or just go to operahack.org and you can find all that information and get in touch with me. Um, anything else, David? No, this is great. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone, for attending.